Welcome back to the Future of Photography. I'm Chris, and with me today, Imar and Jeremiah. Hi there. Hello. Hi. And uh, Adrian can't make it today, but um, that's fine because we can do without him. He's least having too much fun somewhere. <laughs> it's probably true. Let's hope so. <laughs> um, 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 this episode. Is um, is going to be interesting for uh, several different reasons. The first is that um, we already recorded it, and then we lost it because it was a technical glitch. All my fault. I take full responsibility for that. Um, the second thing is that, um, as you saw in the title, photos that changed my f uh, future of photography. Um, that we have recorded something kind of similar before and that was um, episode 124 about our influences so when we decided on doing this series the photos that changed my future photography um, as opposed to back in episode 124 looking outside at external influences I was looking at internal influences this time so I've picked um, three photos that have changed my future of photography and those are three photos that I have um, yeah, o taken over the years and they go along with, with certain experiences and with uh, certain learnings. So uh, having that said, I'll bring the first one up and it's a photo of a shopping cart in an open kind of space. And that, that photo has changed my, f definitely has changed my future of photography because um, that's from back in 2007 and it was one of the early pictures I took with my first DSLR, my first digital SLR. Um, as as many of you, I have a, a, an SLR background and it just, um, yeah, it, it was this new world and uh, I, I guess some of you might remember that, the new world where you could suddenly afford a an SLR with a digital chip in it and um, that changed my whole way of approaching experimentation in photography so can I can I ask you about this absolutely um, what what prompted you to take this picture was it just something you passed and quickly shot or did you see it and 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 search for the right angle which it looks like because it's a low angle and lining up the kind of vanishing lines and the disturbance of the of the cart in the middle which kind of parallels the mm -hmm. right side vanishing mm -hmm. um but but how spontaneous was this um relative to how formal it it was when you composed it and and how did it change based on the photographs that you had been taking before so the overall session and it was a bit of a session was a spontaneous one i had time i had the camera with me i was roaming the neighborhood uh, or a different neighborhood and i saw this x x grocery store i mean that was kind of a torn down one and all those shopping carts where they were talking like 50 shopping carts at least and i snuck my way in there it was kind of cordoned off but wasn't too hard to get in there and I spent I don't know probably half an hour there probably a bit longer and the fact that I was not shooting on film but on a digital chip meant that I had like I, I, I could try a lot of different things and that's um, that was a dramatic change for me because had I shot this on film I would have taken three pictures and that that would have been it but um, doing this on a on a digital platform um, I probably shot a uh, hundred photos there of different compositions of the shopping carts, of different angles, and um, this is the o the only one of those photos that I've that I'm showing, and that was another very important learning experience for me. So the first one was the experience, uh, the the experimentation, the the freedom that I had all of a sudden to take as many pictures as I liked, and the other was a, a learning experience that happened a bit later when I went through those pictures back home. And I remember making a very clear, d distinct decision to not show more than one picture, to choose one pick, and that is it. So I still have 
probably have like 30 or 40 of those other photos on my hard drive somewhere. But um, huh? I, I, I did editing in terms of not showing uh, many of those photos. W w was it sa safe to say that you were influenced um, by the environment, by the light uh, or, or both? and felt it was so unique you needed to spend time and there was an image there to capture before you got this shot. That was, that was the general feeling. I mean, you don't often come by uh, a, an abandoned grocery store with old shopping carts in there. So that was a... Uh, Not every day. <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that was a bit of an unusual thing. So that made me go, oh, I, I need to find something here. And I also had this idea of... Uh, um, th there must be a picture in there. This did not. Uh, this did not show itself while I was there. I only found this later in the whole batch, uh, and it just was the one that felt most right. So it didn't even go for any formal principles. It just felt right. And much later, I started analyzing why it feels right. And um, I I Imer, um, mm. do you uh, have you ever gone into a situation which? By the way, when you when we were shooting film in the in the olden days and mm -hmm. currently, there is a really interesting process wherein we may shoot less, but when we are shooting, there's no feedback. We just like shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, and then maybe days later, often weeks later, uh, we will review our pictures with a very different mindset, right? Mm. So the, the, the exploration of spontaneously shot pictures with no intention, and then the editing of those pictures, I'm not talking about uh, uh, adjusting color mm. and, and composition, I'm just talking about going, that's the image. Mm. Um, w this is really for both of you. There is uh, another exploration. In other words, Chris, when you discovered this unique environment uh, at this unique moment and searched for the right image or, or a, a, an inspired moment to take the image, um, there's that very similar thing when you're reviewing the image, uh, whether it's processed or digital. We tend now to look immediately at our screens to get some kind of feedback, but there is something really um, uh, there's a parallel in in filmmaking. We we used to shoot, you know, our 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 shots during the day, and and you know whether it's five ten thousand feet, and then we would get together and screen the dailies. Uh, maybe you know uh, that night or later the next day and review it with the advantage of some time between when we did it uh, and how we felt about doing it. Because when we may have been very excited about a particular shot, performance, scene, light, whatever it is, and yet when we saw it, there may have been another take, which may have been, for example, even slightly out of focus, flawed, not as good, but with a performance that it was electrifying that we may have rejected before. Mm -hmm. And so there is a shift, and I'd like. I like to ask both of you how you feel between the moment of capture and the moment of selection, whether it's instant, fast, or over a long period of time. I'd like to hear from Emer mm. about this. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I think it depends on um, depends on the situation. I think sometimes you just know when um, when you. I don't know if I'm out snapping away. Sometimes I know that's that's my picture or that's the one, but I don't like that. Like you kept the 30 or 40 other photos that you took. Um, and what I think is interesting is what drives us to keep all the other ones, even though we find like, like what are we keeping those 30 for? Is anybody ever going to see them? It's like I, I kind of might take 20, 30 as well. And I have a terrible habit of not deleting uh, any of them, even if I do select, OK, that's my best one, because maybe six months later, I'll scroll back through the camera and go, oh, oh, look yeah. at you. I missed exactly. you the first time around. And then exactly, yeah. I have an idea for some way I want to treat it. Um, so Over why? I don't know. What is the, the thing that drives us to keep? Like if you've put them away on a hard drive somewhere, you ever you ever going to look at them again yourself? Maybe. 
uh, I have uh, over the years I have actually um, formalized that process of mm. going back to older photos and deleting at least a part of them. Um, I've, I've I've really spent time building my workflow that allows me to sift through the photos and to 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 prune them down to the that what I call uh, not even the essentials but the ones I want to keep. Just uh, you probably have a portfolio, there, do you as well? That you yeah, keep and and and, and I I kind of need to be able to pull out my I don't know the five star photos from the last mm. two years and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I've, I've, but I don't know many people that do that. So mm. yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, yeah. I, but I, I have a different workflow. In other words, anything that I feel uh, is solid enough to belong in a folio uh, gets, pro you know, I, I edit it and process yeah. it and, and, and put it in a separate folio. And those folios I re-import into Lightroom under separate files. So I do have the kind of base management of, you know, 100,000 pictures yeah. or whatever it is on my drive. But I, but I, it's easily, um, I, I can go to the root mm -hmm. of, of all of those photos or I can go to the finals. Um, yeah. And oh, that's that, so that seems to work. <laughs> that seems to work. But I have a follow-up question it, specific to that photo is how did that photo, when you saw it, uh, become a eureka moment for you in terms of driving your intentions forward? Well, it, again, it was, it was this moment of experimentation that really did a lot for me. It was the moment uh, where I realized that I need to have some restraint in what I show. And then the photo itself, at that time, again, this is 2007, um, it, it really just felt right. And I had no clue why that was. And that was also beginning to, to kick off an exploration of, um, of, of composition and, and just understanding better why certain photos work more than others do why some click with me more than others do that was pretty much a this all kind of coincides with the same time frame where i also started with my podcasts and um i had started that two years before that and and i've never learned anything so quickly um before and the reason is because you just learn much quicker when you try to teach others you know so so i was really starting uh very small and and i had this amazingly quick um uh learning curve to to get to that point where um where i finally understood that oh here's lines and they are parallel to the others and there's uh an open space and there's there's a, there's a how that interacts with the rest and the the missing wheel that gives it a different layer mm -hmm. of a story and so on so there's like a whole lot of things going on that i didn't realize at that time it just felt right it was just a gut feeling thing at that point e emer can you see the um the the parallel or the connection between this image and chris's later work say in landscape uh, yeah, okay. a lot of them, are, the, the, the drama, there's a lot of drama in this. The low angle is lovely. Um, is that something that you had always liked or oh, it, did it was, this it was different. shot lead I, you I, to? I took 100 photos, so I tried different things. I experimented, yeah. I played. It and was more of a, of a spray and pray effort, uh, approach there. And that included going low and trying to mm. get the angles right and get it very horizontal and... and trying different things but um, I think I even moved that shopping cart in place for that photo just to line okay. it up somehow even though I didn't mm -hmm. really know what I was doing but it felt it felt like mm. it was the right thing so anyway experimentation and, and restraint that's kind of the two things that I took away from this photo the next one is a group shot and that group shot is um, well it, it has it has a it has a historical um, connotation for me because that was in 2011 and that was a couple of years after we, uh, Monica and I, we rediscovered film photography after we had put it to the side for I don't even know, probably 10 years or so. 
And uh, the rediscovering that brought us in contact with, um, with two friends who own a shop, an online shop for film and chemicals and things. So they had this photo supply store. Um, that was the time when everything had kind of moved online. And um, they had their offices on the, on the grounds of Rolleye, the German photo camera company. So uh, we teamed up with them and the shop and we started holding uh, film photography workshops. And that was the first time that I shot large format, 4x5. So this is shot through a 4x5 inch uh, large format pinhole camera. And again, comes down to experimentation, comes down to this just this this feeling of being on on sacred grounds um the mm. the office we did the workshop in was like the the office of the former boss of the company so it's like really you, you could feel the spirit in the air and mm. uh this is a triple exposure which was completely unintentional this is a photo um that i mean Anyone who's shot 4x5 knows that the camera will not do any thinking for you. You have to do all the individual steps and there are about 15 different ways you can make mistakes and one of them is that you do not mark your your film <laughs> <Sliders>. cassettes <laughs> and uh, you just forget which one you exposed and then <laughs> you end up uh, getting a triple exposure. I still like it. I'm still happy with it because it's a group shot. It's a shot of a Mercedes-Benz small truck kind of thing, an old one. And it's a shot of the Rolai uh, building in the, on the side. So it really kind of is, is a shot that has... And that, that little Mercedes transporter that's just there. Uh, that's part of the inventory there. So this is really kind of a, a shot of this entire workshop weekend in one picture, in one in three exposures. So it make it make a really good album cover. It would, <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. I was thinking that too. Lovely it space really, really for text up on top here. And by the way, as we know that Chris is very influenced by rock and roll photography and photography yes. of musicians <laughs> and is a musician and uh, a sonic genius, and, and uh, which is why we sound so good. Um, <laughs> The, the, the irony here, unlike the previous picture, is this is the, what we would call the happy accident, the, mm -hmm. the mistake that turns into art, and then you can explore that. I have a sidebar question, Chris. What happened to Rolle? Where are they now? And I ask this because my very first camera was a twin lens reflex, uh, Rolleiflex, so... I'm very curious what happened to it. And I had one of those little tiny rollies way back in the 70s. So yeah. what happened? Um, so so to my knowledge, I mean, Ro Rollet, the when the when the whole film photography thing collapsed, I think Rolly went with it. Um, there's two of their employees who kept doing Rollet cameras, the Rollet twin reflex cameras, the TLRs, the two-eyed ones that we all know um, under a different name. In the same building with using using old equipment of them but then that didn't last forever so a few years ago probably five uh, roughly five i think five years ago um i got an email from someone who uh forwarded a website with an auction uh where they auctioned off the old Raleigh equipment that was still left so oh. um there's nothing left the building is an old brick building beautiful um the the one place in at the back of the building is there like an, a big brick wall with lots of numbers and symbols on it. And that was a test wall for testing optical quality and things. So they had that on the outside shooting across a parking lot. Um, and yeah, the, the, company, the building is still there, but the company or the, the remains of the company even don't exist anymore, unfortunately. It's a pity. Emer, e Emer, have you ever um, consciously or unconsciously cr uh, made images that um, that were accidental, but inspired you to move in a direction where you start to embrace the, I guess the the accidental technique that you discovered by accident, and and uh, 
you know, kind of charge that into a creative shaping of multiple images? Yeah, actually, a um, long time ago, um, the, the sort of bodies and movement thing I became a bit obsessed with way, way back. And my my degree show was like a series of images based on um, like the softness of the body, the movement and the kind of ghostly look, but but against very sharp backgrounds and different textures and thing and I got totally obsessed with that and I did discover that as kind of a bit of an accident while um, playing about with the camera in the back garden of the college um, and yeah it just kicked me off on a whole year's worth of work back then and happy accidents are brilliant they happen I think all the time yeah I think we're saying mm. don't run away from uh <laughs> accidental shots I, and I think uh, it, it helps if we set ourselves up for those even I mean when when we go into our our uh, tfop uh, discord we have our showcase channel and uh, for the last couple of weeks there was all this after we did the episode of snapshots there was all this stuff like like Adrian doing his project with uh, hipstamatic and setting it to a random mode like shake for random and it yeah. dials in random parameters and filters and then he posted those um, quite regularly for for a week or two and um, he's still doing it yeah for me and a technique was um, Again, after I went digital, I started to experiment with street photography and shooting from the wrist without looking, just generally aiming at something mm. and shooting while walking past someone. And that helped me discover that uh, weird angles aren't a bad thing, you know, because yeah, you I cannot think. avoid them. A Adrian, Adrian uh, inspired me to get uh, a remote uh, trigger little tiny little remote trigger Bluetooth for my iPhone. And uh, just the other day, I went for my daily walk, <laughs> the canals as I do. And I, I wore my camera kind of face in. So it's just hanging around my neck. And I had my little remote in my pocket. And sneaky, sneaky. Uh, was, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was was using that um, that black and white app that we've all kind of oh, embraced yeah, yeah. lately. Uh, the Argentum app. Argentum, yep. Argentum, Argentum yeah. yeah. And just m whenever I saw people coming, I just, but my, there is a delay <laughs> I oh, discovered okay. uh, between taking the, the action of snapping and it snapping. And so I have a lot of arms leaving the frame. <laughs> <laughs> feet, <laughs> but I will I will perfect that technique, and yeah, I yeah. owe it to our um, Adrian uh, for inspiring uh, that in terms of street photography. Really, really fun. I've just I've just come across um, a, a I think it's a prototype. There's this this uh, smartphone manufacturer Vivo Vivo. I don't know. I it's, whatever they do, it's a little prototype, a little a study of a smartphone with a little camera that pops out from the top. And then you can take it and it comes off. So you have a tiny little remote camera that you can put anywhere. Um, speaking of dystopian vibes again. <laughs> <laughs> double, double tape it to your head. Yeah, probably. <laughs> anyway, so... Anyway, um, yes, continue, Chris. We're, yeah, um, we're, th third, we're third, uh, third time is the charm. This is picture number three. And this, um, again... This pushed me in a different direction because beautiful just um so so the story behind this is it's a four by five picture taken with the a proper four by five camera with the proper optics not a not a pinhole it's inside the um Fre freiburg dome which is all, all the way in the south of germany a beautiful church and they're not supposed to shoot in there but a friend and i we both had our four by fives with us and we both just went in there, set up our tripod, set up the cameras, the cloths over the head, started composing, mm -hmm. and we looked so deliberate, official. It's like when you walk onto a construction site, you put a hard hat and an orange <laughs> vest on, and then you end up being accepted as one of them. So we were like... A clipboard we, helps too, by the way. It does, yeah. We, we looked so official that no one bothered us, and um we just took a couple of photos each and then went out again and this one is this one was a good lesson in well first of all 
maybe don't ask for permission, ask for, for forgiveness later, just in case. And in this case, You're it, in the right place. It, it paid off, yeah. Um, the other thing is that um, it taught me a lot about shifting a camera, as in, you know, if you want to so get this whole church in, you have to tilt it backwards, and then you have all those falling lines. In this case, you just keep the picture so much more tidy when you when you t use that property of a 4x5 camera or a shift lens. Um, so it, it, it just helps pull and keep the photo to bet better together, and it it feels more 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 tidy. I think tidy is the proper word for it. With, with any, all the vertical lines. Any manipulation speed. on this in terms um, of post, like burning, dodging, painting, or was this the right really, exposure? Not really. The um, the there's there's a bit of contrast after scanning, um, a bit of like black point and and white point and midpoint, but that is pretty much it. Um, the other thing is it, it was my first time working with a so-called aura film. If you look at the candles at the bottom, they all have a halo around them. Mm. They have this glow around them. And that's because that film doesn't have what's called an anti-halation layer. So I love the way they're glowing on top of the people. The light just on the people is gorgeous. Thank you. And, and, you, and you, get, uh, the, you get that with specific kinds of film that is still possible to get. And they, they just still leave make off. that film. I think they do. You have to look for Aura A U R A film because that's what this does with like point light sources and lights uh, shining into the lens. It, it that that layer is on film to re to eliminate internal reflection. So the light shooting back through mm. the film at the back of the camera and coming back out as a reflection that gets typically gets taken away by that layer. So you don't get these effects, but they if they leave that layer out, that's just uh it just does amazing things with uh with the lights and this was this did was you, a, an accident. Did, did you expose it with a spot meter or just a general <laughs> exposure and get lucky? No, no, no. That's that's um uh spot meter exposure. Um not a handheld one. What I did is I walked up to one of those pillars and metered there. So mm -hmm. I I made my metering spot smaller by walking and then mm -hmm. um that's what i put kind of in the middle those pillars with the light on the pillars um yeah, after yeah, after assessing sure. the room and looking around and trying to find out where that middle ground is um yeah well three very distinct styles and three very mm. distinct appreciations of the process of photography and they all gave me um something uh, they all changed something for me in a f pretty remarkable way for me. So my photography has been different after each of those photos. Um, and it wasn't too hard to, f to pick those out, to be honest, because they all ch did a change that I remember very distinctly. Anyway, I think that's it for this episode. For you. <laughs> for me, <laughs> yeah. Sure. We'll have more of those. Um, who's left? Who's got? Who's left to do it? Well, I, mm. I think yeah. I, I think you, I am. I, I just did my influences last yeah. time. I don't think I, I picked. You didn't do uh, the internal. No, we I have to. We that. have to go back into our notes and have a look and figure mm. that out. But um, yeah. there's at least one or two are left. I think Adrian didn't do his as well. So. Mm. Um, yeah um yeah that was it for today um let me bring up our beautiful end screen where um you find all our information where to contact us uh again on twitter on insta we're at tfop now on our discord mm -hmm. um there's i think now over 40 people signed up so the community is growing and there's a lot of photo sharing there a lot of discussing about potential future photo topics so we'd love you to sh to share kind your fun. yeah it's, it's really fun we'd love to share you to share your um stuff too there at tfttf.com slash join what tfop. would be your pick of the week chris um i didn't prepare a pick of the week did oh huh did i just unintentionally skip over the you pick did. of the week <laughs> that is there are people who who listen to the show precisely for that Pick. You're right, and I <laughs> apologize. Um, I will skip my pick of the week today. Um, which one did you bring, 
Jeremiah. Uh, I brought a photographer's work called Melanie uh, Wil Wilhide. Um, and uh, her work, <laughs> I find her work absolutely tremendous in that, because we were talking about accidents, um, I was I inspired uh, by your use of accidents to apply that to digital work and, and uh, digital glitching uh, to create uh, basically very unexpected and strange imagery um, that is unique and specific to her and captivating. Um, so it is again a celebration of accidental work which is now focused for for her in a direction and a style that um, I think uh, belays great talent here. So um, that's why it's there. Explore the work. I love it. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can totally see that. I like that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That goes in the show notes, of course. Um, do we have another one? I did. You know what? I hastily found one, but I thought that we were going to end up doing a different topic. So I want to keep it now for <laughs> that other topic Withholding. that we talked about. Well, I, I do have one. Okay, I still, I still have one that is. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's the the one that Adrian liked when we recorded this show for the first time, and we. Um, it it feels like it. we've already done this on the show, but. Um, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's a little six second movie that I found on Reddit of all places. And it is, um, without sound here, it is a six second movie of someone smashing <laughs> things. Let me see if that plays. It's supposed to play. It is not. Uh, Okay, that's what happens when you're not well prepared. Um, mm. Let me refresh that. It's okay, also here we go. fascinating for radio. It is. Uh, well, <laughs> this is this is the place where everyone should probably go and uh, have and a look smash. at the video one. Um, yeah. We'll link it in the show notes and then you can uh, figure out if you like it or not. I would think um, <coughs> it's a pretty cool little stop motion thing. It's a fun yeah. stop motion thing about mm. lenses of a specific manufacturer and what you can do with them. If you have enough time and um, imagination on your hands. So um, that was it for today. And uh, we'll be back soon. Probably with Adrian again, I guess. I hope so. And uh, thanks, Imar. Thanks, Jeremiah, for your time. Thank and you. thanks, everyone who's watching or listening. Uh, see you soon. Until then, take care. And bye. Bye bye. Bye, all.